Okay, then welcome everybody to our TTMU uh, seminar. It's a great pleasure that Uwe Jens Wieser agreed to give a second uh, talk on uh, asymptotic free quantum fields, in particular quantum link models, uh, since there was a high interest last time. So uh, for the audience, if you have questions, please uh, just unmute yourself and speak up. Uh, otherwise, uh, please, uh, Uwe, uh, yeah, take it away. Yeah, thank you very much, Johannes, for the invitation. It's my pleasure to give the second part of this talk. And um, the goal is to explain how uh, non-abelian gauge fields like gluon fields can emerge from uh, discrete quantum uh, degrees of freedom, which we call quantum links. And um, this is uh, the gauge variant of what I talked about last time, where I tried to explain how um, scalar fields uh, like CPN model fields can emerge uh, from quantum spin degrees of freedom. So um, let me show you the outline of my talk. Uh, the first half uh, was given a bit more than a month ago. And uh, there I discussed a bit different hierarchies of scales, essentially in order to point out that asymptotically free theories naturally exist uh, very far below their ultimate uh, ultraviolet cutoff, um, which we could imagine as uh, the Planck scale. Uh, and in practice, it is a lattice scale uh, which could be extremely short because asymptotically free theories uh, naturally without fine tuning produce correlation lengths that are exponentially large in these lattice units. And that allows us to take a continuum limit, uh, which is uh, typically described by quantum field theory. Um, and uh, in the first part of my talk, I argued that these theories, in particular the CPN models, which exist in one plus one space-time dimensions, can be regularized somewhat unconventionally by using SUN quantum spins. Of course, usually one would simply start with uh, fields in a CPN manifold and then stick them into a path integral and uh, do a functional integral. But here we start in a sense at a more fundamental level um, with discrete quantum spin degrees of freedom, which then live in an extra spatial dimension. But then uh, there is a very natural mechanism for dimensional reduction. So the dimensional reduction of discrete variables is an unconventional uh, regularization of asymptotically free theories and today I would like to extend this picture to gauge theories. Um, but uh, I uh, just want to remind you a little bit of part one or for at least for those who have attended the first part um, and so I'll show you a few slides on these quantum spin systems. And uh, CPN models, which are asymptotically free field theories, uh, which share interesting features with quantum chromodynamics, like asymptotic freedom, the non-perturbative generation of a mass gap, even uh, non-trivial topology and theta vacuum states, uh, they can be regularized with SUN quantum spins. Now, uh, quantum spin is a generator of um, algebra, in this case, SUN. So we have these uh, TAX objects. They are associated with the sites of a spatial lattice. In this case, I assume a two-dimensional spatial lattice. Um, but they are quantum objects. Uh, you can think of them as Gelman matrices. For SU2, they would just be Pauli matrices obeying the standard uh, commutation relations. So they are quantum spins which uh, appear here in some nearest neighbor, a little bit complicated looking quantum Hamilton operator. So it's a quantum mechanical system of discrete spins that live on a two-dimensional spatial lattice. Um, this is an antiferromagnet and uh, it couples these white 
dots which represent color triplets for SU3 to the black dots which represent color untreated triplets in SU3. Um, and if we would be in SU2, they would all just be spins one half. And in any case, this is a quantum system. It's completely finite. There's nothing divergent about it. It is totally regularized on the lattice. And uh, this particular system has a global SUN symmetry. If we add up all the spins on the A sides, which are the triplet spins, and then add all the anti-triplet spins, which are represented by the negative complex conjugate of that generator here, uh, then we get a total spin which is conserved and commutes with the Hamiltonian. So this is a peculiar quantum system, a quantum spin ladder of SUN quantum spins, which enjoys a global SUN symmetry. And then you could stare at this Hamiltonian for a long time. You would uh, almost certainly not be able to figure out what the system wants to do because this is a non-trivial, non-perturbative problem which requires numerical simulations, which we did a long time ago. And then you figure out that this system um, in two plus one dimensions breaks its SUN symmetry spontaneously down to the subgroup UN minus one. And that means that the system, at least at zero temperature on an infinite 2D lattice, has massless Goldstone bosons. And these Goldstone bosons are described by a low energy effective field theory. And the fields live in the coset space in which we identify those points in the symmetry group SUN that are related by transformations in the unbroken subgroup UN minus one. And that uh, space happens to be the CPN minus one complex projective manifold. And we, one can parameterize this manifold by Hermitian uh, matrices of trace one, which have this projector property. Um, so out from these discrete quantum spins emerges a very long distance, infinite long correlation length Goldstone boson, which is described by this effective quantum field theory. And uh, following the rules of effective field theory, one would then write down an action. The action contains uh, as few derivatives as possible, as consistent with the symmetries of the system. So here we have derivatives in the x direction, in the time direction, and in the y direction. And we integrate over two plus one dimensional space time. There is also this term that has mixed derivatives with respect to x and t. Um, and this would be the starting point of a systematic low energy effective theory. There are also higher order terms which can be viewed as corrections. Um, so this is what the system would do if it would live in uh, two plus one uh, extended dimensions. Um, but the system that I'm focusing on here is actually short in one of the spatial dimensions. This uh, uh, dimension of extent L prime, um, which simply counts the number of spin chains that are antiferromagnetically coupled spin chains that I have coupled in this extra dimension. Uh, and if that dimension is of finite extent, uh, then the Merman Wagner theorem tells us that the system is effectively only one plus one dimensional and can therefore no longer break its global symmetry spontaneously which means that the previously massless Goldstone bosons will no longer be strictly massless, but will pick up a mass non-perturbatively. And uh, that mass gives rise to a now finite correlation length. And then the question is, how big is that correlation length compared to the now small extent of the second spatial dimension, this L prime here? Now I will, uh, argue that the correlation length is naturally much, much bigger than this L prime. And therefore the field effectively becomes Y independent, which will mean that this Y derivative term will drop out and that I can 
integrate the y dimension trivially uh, and I'll get a factor of L prime. This is what I call poor man's dimensional reduction. Peter Hasenfratz and Ferenc Niedermeyer, who unfortunately passed away far too young, were experts in doing this much more professionally by integrating out systematically all the non-zero modes and deriving an effective field theory for the zero modes. Um, but the result to leading order is the same. Uh, essentially, the y direction disappears. But that assumes that the correlation length is very much larger than the extent L prime of that extra dimension. And so then I arrive at this effective action here. And instead of the L in prime integration, I have a factor one over G squared here. And that one over G squared is actually uh, the product of this uh, spin stiffness coefficient, the extent of the second spatial dimension divided by the spin wave velocity, which also appears here in this uh, time derivative term. Um, also, there is a theta vacuum term that emerges and theta is given by the number n of transversely coupled spin chains times pi. Now, the coupling constant here is dimensionless. Um, and if we look at this uh, effective action after dimensional reduction, it is nothing but the action of a one plus one dimensional CPN model. And these models are known to be asymptotically free. And that simply means that the correlation length is exponentially large in the inverse coupling one over G squared here. This is actually the Tohuft coupling N times G squared and this four pi here is just the beta function coefficient that uh, controls the exponential um, size of the correlation length. Now, since the one over G squared is now given by the extent of the system in the third, second spatial dimension, this L prime, uh, the correlation length increases exponentially with L prime and therefore indeed is much larger than L prime as long as L prime itself is not ridiculously small. And so then we did numerical simulations and calculated the correlation length of this system of this quantum spin ladder there with two, uh, four or six transversely coupled spin chains. Uh, and this brought us closer and closer to the continuum limit of this dimensionally reduced uh, asymptotically free CPN minus one model. We did this for different CPN models. And if you do it for CP2 with two, four and six transversely coupled spin chains, you generate correlation lengths that become bigger and bigger and as big as 61 if you have a transverse dimension of uh, six, extend six. Uh, so this just shows that this uh, actually works and uh, we can use that underlying completely finite quantum mechanical SUN spin ladder system to regularize uh, the asymptotically free dimensionally reduced only one plus one dimensional CPN model. And uh, then I showed you uh, and uh, I saw that Uli is uh, in the audience uh, the step scaling function last time already that was introduced in this paper by Martin Lüscher, Peter Weiss and Uli Wolf, um, which measures the response of a, the, the system um, to squeezing it into a finite volume. So if we put the system in a periodic box of size L, the correlation length, which would like to be fairly big, would be limited by the size of the system. And then if we liberate the system a little bit more and put it in a, a size of a double length, um, the ratio of the correlation length, the factor by which the correlation length expands, is a universal function that depends on the ratio this uh, Michael Fisher scaling variable, the ratio of the correlation lengths to the box size of the original small box. And this is actually a completely characteristic function for each uh, asymptotically free theory here. It's the function for the CP2 model. Uh, you see a comparison of two simulations, the 
purple squares are what you get when you use Wilson type standard approach to non perturbative field theory on the lattice. You would introduce these uh, CPN fields directly, so you would really start from a quantum field theory. And the black dots are what you get if you start from the quantum spin system, which at first glance doesn't look so much as a quantum field theory, but it's a local theory in space and time. It has the SU3 symmetry and uh, it has a very good reason to produce a very long correlation length because in the higher dimension, in this case two plus one, it exists in a massless phase with Goldstone bosons, which have an infinite correlation length. And then by squeezing the system in one direction, um, we give these Goldstone bosons a non-perturbative mass, a finite correlation length, dimensional reduction happens, and we get the desired asymptotically free uh, quantum field theory. It's an unconventional way of regularizing um, the CPN models. And then um, we did some uh, you know, finite chemical potential calculations. I will not go into those details. And also we collaborated with Peter Zoller, who is a leading expert in atomic, molecular, and optical quantum optics physics. And together with them, uh, we proposed experiments which have not yet been done, but, but are feasible today where you can build a quantum simulator to actually realize these dynamics with what is called alkaline earth atoms. And that's more or less where I stopped last time. So the main message of this first part of the talk was that you can start with unconventional quantum spin degrees of freedom if you uh, convince them to interact collectively so that they produce long range physics, um, and in this case, this goes via Goldstone bosons, then you are in business for extracting in the low energy continuum limit, the physics of a interesting non-perturbative quantum field theory. And so there are um, both uh, numerical simulation reasons to perhaps go in this direction. There are um, efficient numerical algorithms, uh, cluster algorithms similar to the ones that Uli Wolf developed in the 90s, um, where, in which we can deal very efficiently with these quantum spins. And um, uh, also we can hope to uh, do quantum simulation experiments for aspects of the dynamics that are not accessible to classical computation, for example, real-time evolution. I should have said that um, there are other people involved, and I forgot that this is one of the few papers where Debasish Banerjee, who is a member of this collaboration, was not involved, but in the gauge part, he is definitely involved, and you will see this as well. So are there any questions about this part which I only wanted to remind those of who have seen it before and sort of to give you an um, idea what I now want to extend to gauge theories. So the uh, direction L, L prime was uh, can be small, it's, it's finite. But um, uh, L, do you take? Uh, do you need to take uh, L to infinity, or, or? Yeah. So, the the L dimension is conceptually very large, and it should be as big as you can afford in your practical numerical work, right? But it, it's also uh, it simply provides at the end the physical size of the system. Of course. Uh, Usually we would like to take the infinite volume limit of a quantum field theory, then this L would have to be infinite. But the physics is also completely well defined in a finite volume as long as we take the, continu the continuum limit, which would require to send this L to infinity in lattice units, but then keep the ratio with the physical correlation length fixed. So, so uh, yeah, e essentially L goes to infinity in the continuum limit, but uh, it's also used to probe the response of the system to the physical volume of the box into which we put it.
Okay. So, sorry, I, I have one more question. Uh, what, what methods were you using to solve the spin system? Um, last time I showed you the quantum uh, loop algorithms that we developed a very long time ago, also in continuous time together with Bernard Beard. So these are very efficient uh, uh, cluster algorithms which uh, are applicable not only to SU2 but also to SUN quantum spins. I could Thanks. say more about it, but I, I said a lot about this in the first part of the talk. So if you are really- No, I just wanted to get reminded, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. All right, so then maybe, uh, I mean, unless there are further questions, we can go into the gauge theory talk. And so this is just to uh, get you motivated. There's a lot of things that lattice gauge theory can do for QCD. It's a wonderful tool that has matured over decades to a quantitative method to solve quantum chromodynamics very quantitatively. Um, but there are certain things that we don't know how to do, like work at very high values of the baryon chemical potential or do real-time evolution as it occurs in a heavy ion collision. And uh, these are motivations perhaps to um, uh, construct quantum simulation experiments or quantum computations of such systems because then the sign problem which prevents uh, the simulation with classical computers is no longer present. Of course, these methods are in, an, in their infancy and there's a lot of work to be done before this can be applied to QCD. But what um, I'm trying to say is at least we have a formulation, we have a motivation and uh, we have already started 10 years ago, together with Peter Zoller and Debastige, to go in this direction. Um, but uh, the focus of my talk today is not so much on quantum simulation as on the formulation of quantum link models, which we used in order to construct these quantum simulation experiments, which again have not yet been done, but are partly feasible, not yet for full QCD, but so I, my goal is to explain how gauge fields like gluon fields can emerge from discrete quantum degrees of freedom, some generalization of quantum spins, which we call quantum links. And so uh, here's Richard Feynman, who wrote a visionary paper in 1982, which is the reference uh, to which all quantum simulation uh, uh, work uh, refers and he said at that time it does seem to be true that all the various field theories have the same kind of behavior and can be simulated in every way apparently with little lattice works of spins and other things. I mean at that time Wilson's lattice field theory existed and for sure he knew about it but this sounds a little bit uh, more general and uh, it is exactly what we are doing now. So, uh, uh, and, and how does this work? So the main um, um, claim here is that gauge fields exist in nature. I mean, we describe nature with gauge fields and uh, uh, the nature produces these objects way below the Planck scale. And this is no big surprise because non-abelian gauge fields are asymptotically free and generate their correlation length as uh, exponentially um, beyond the Planck length. And uh, abelian gauge fields can exist in Coulomb phases in four dimensions, are therefore massless, have infinite correlation length. Um, so we don't need unnatural fine tuning to uh, produce such phenomena. And so gauge fields exist, of course, already in the classical Maxwell equations. Um, and then we can use these gauge fields and uh, impose the rules of quantum uh, 
uh, physics, which I'm doing here in the Hamiltonian formulation, where the electric field operator is the conjugate momentum to the vector potential. Uh, then I should point out that in a gauge theory, in a quantum field theory, Gauss's law is no longer an operator identity, but a constraint on the physical states which must obey this law in order to belong to the physical Hilbert space. So the Hilbert space contains all kinds of stuff that is not physical and Gauss's law filters out the gauge invariant physical states. Then uh, Wilson takes this uh, a step further. Here I uh, discuss this in the context of U1 gauge theory on the lattice. Um, he turns this into a non-perturbative uh, framework and uh, he replaces the vector potential uh, which naturally is part of a covariant derivative uh, by a parallel transporter which is the natural connection between uh, discrete distant uh, lattice points neighboring points x and y are connected by a parallel transporter and it is no longer the vector potential, but the parallel transporter itself that is the fundamental degree of freedom. Now, Wilson himself introduced the theory in the Lagrangian formulation, which is also the most uh, natural one for numerical lattice gauge theory simulations. But here I am using the Hamiltonian formulation that was pioneered by Kogut and Susskind. And then the electric uh, field operator which resides on the links x y together with the parallel transporters here uh, is again a conjugate uh, momentum to the link variable the link variable is a quantum rotor if you like it's uh, like a particle on a circle the circle is the gauge group u1 and so the electric field in a Wilson type U1 lattice gauge theory is just the angular momentum that is conjugate to the angle that describes the parallel transporter. And then just like in the continuum, E and A have a commutation relation, E and U in a lattice gauge theory have the corresponding commutation relation. So this is, essentially fixing the structure of the gauge theory. And then uh, on the lattice, there are links that emanate from a point X. They run into a neighboring point X plus I. And uh, this combination here actually adds up the electric fields that flow out of a point X in the forward direction and into the point X from the backward direction and this is nothing but the lattice divergence of the electric field. Um, if you subtract the charge density of uh, matter fields that may be part of the theory, then again, there is a Gauss law, which means that the uh, wave functional of these link variables must be annihilated by this uh, gauge generating operator. Okay, this is all completely standard. This is how gauge theories work. Uh, first classically, then quantum physically, and finally even beyond perturbation theory. Now, quantum link models uh, follow very much the same logic, except that they implement these structures uh, on a finite dimensional Hilbert space. I said that the Wilson theory, even on a single link, uh, is equivalent to a particle on a group theory circle. And this has infinitely many quantum states and therefore an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. We can realize the algebraic structures of this theory in a finite dimensional Hilbert space. And in particular, in a Hilbert space of any size that we want because we can uh, say this U object, it's a parallel transporter, but it's no longer a complex phase in U1. Let it be a raising operator of a quantum spin. It's an operator, it used to be an operator, but a different one than in the quantum link model. 
The inverse of this, the dagger operator, which uh, goes backward from y to x, so to speak, is the lowering operator of spin. And the conjugate uh, momentum uh, is, in this case, the third component of spin. And then uh, it is uh, easy to convince yourself that the commutation relations of these objects among each other are more or less the same as in the Wilson theory. Essentially, this relation here is the same. That is very important. Uh, but it is uh, no longer true that U and U dagger, which used to be just complex phases in the Wilson theory, uh, commute with each other. They now no longer commute and uh, their commutator is this uh, electric field object. So this is clearly a different theory, but it is a gauge theory. And this I am trying to explain on the next transparency where I first go back to the Wilson theory. There we have a link. On the link lives a parallel transporter. Its values uh, are in the gauge group. There's a canonically conjugate momentum angular momentum in case of U1, if you like. And uh, then these things obey certain commutation relations. Uh, e does not commute with U, E does not commute with U dagger, but U commutes with U dagger because these are just complex numbers. Uh, there is a generator of a U1 gauge transformation, which is uh, given by this lattice divergence here. And that is an operator that exists at every spatial lattice point X and commutes with the Hamiltonian. So unlike in the quantum spin system that I showed you before, there was only one generator, a global generator, the sum of all spins which commuted with the Hamiltonian. Here we have local symmetry, gauge symmetry, therefore we have a symmetry at each lattice site. And then um, we can write down a gauge invariant Hamiltonian. It's the sum over all links of the E squared terms on those links. And then this is the plaquette, um, which uh, closes the parallel transport around an elementary lattice square. This represents the magnetic field energy in lattice field theory. Now this Hamiltonian, as I said before, operates in an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. Even on each individual link, the Hilbert space is infinite dimensional. And that is uh, maybe not such a pleasant feature if you want to uh, build a quantum simulation experiment in which you embody this dynamics on some cold atoms in an optical lattice or whatever. And therefore we are interested in the quantum link models. And now I'm doing the same again for the quantum link formulation of a U1 gauge theory. Again, we have a link, we have a parallel transporter, we have a conjugate momentum, but the parallel transporter is now given by the raising operator of spin, its dagger is the lowering operator of spin, and the E is the third component of spin. And this is designed in such a way that the commutator of E with U and E with U dagger is exactly what we saw in the Wilson theory, but U and U dagger no longer commute. Now, does that compromise gauge symmetry? No, it doesn't, because the gauge transformation is constructed exactly as before. It's just the divergence of these E's. The E's are no longer what they used to be, but they obey the same mathematical rules as before. The Hamiltonian looks identically the same, but the objects that appear there are different. They are now quantum spins. Um, and this G commutes with this H exactly for the same reasons as before, because for that, the G object contains only E's and no U's, and the Hamiltonian contains E's and U's. And so if the E's and U's obey these commutation relations, if they commute it in the Wilson theory, they will still commute in the quantum link model. Um, nowhere do we need to commute a U with a U dagger. So this is also a lattice gauge theory with an exact U1 lattice gauge uh, symmetry, although it operates on discrete variables, which you can think of as spin up and spin down on each link. 
um, there's no reason to believe that this should be the same theory as the Wilson theory, and it is definitely not. But you have a freedom of choice. You can choose the representation of these spins as large as you want. You don't have to use spin one half. You could use spin one or spin three halves, or you could use spin 5,000. And if you would do that, you would practically go to the Wilson theory. But quantum link models are really an extension of the concept of lattice gauge theories in which you can construct quite exotic lattice gauge theories that are not accessible in the Wilson framework. Now, why would you want to do, to do that? Uh, uh, some of these systems are very similar to certain condensed matter systems. And this is something that uh, in collaboration with Debussy, we explored a lot. It's not the main focus of my talk here, but I still want to show you a few results for this very simplest. This is, uh, this is the simplest U1 gauge theory that I know of. It's a quantum link model with spins one half. It exists, let's say, on a square lattice. Every link carries a spin one half. It has a two-dimensional Hilbert space. And the Hamiltonian is a, what condensed matter people would call a ring exchange Hamiltonian. Um, if there is electric flux uh, indicated by these little arrows that is flowing around the plaquette, the Hamiltonian will come along and redirect this flux loop in the other direction. If the flux doesn't form a closed loop, like in this case, the Hamiltonian will simply kill this term. And then there is a Gauss law. What flows into a lattice site has to flow out in order to give us a physically acceptable state of the system. So this is one allowed configuration that obeys Gauss's law on a four by four tiny periodic two-dimensional lattice. Okay. Um, are there any questions at this point? At the moment, I have tried to explain the concept of a quantum link model, unconventional discrete quantum degrees of freedom rather than classical fields stuck into a path integral. Um, and we have only talked about U1 gauge theory so far. So if you go to a finite dimensional Hilbert space, um, do you somehow restrict the theories that you can explore or do you um, lose any kind of, in, of information somehow or, or is that true? Yeah, it, it, it always depends on what you want. If, if you want uh, to regularize quantum chromodynamics, uh, then I will try to explain how to do this here. So you are not necessarily losing anything, right? In a sense, you're gaining something here because here's a model that didn't seem to exist before. It has a lot of interesting physics, irrelevant for fundamental particle physics because it has nothing to do with the standard model. Uh, but there are certain gauge theories in condensed matter physics that are very similar and people are exploring these systems in uh, quantum simulation experiments or plan to do such kind of things. So this is sort of uh, a model that has its own uh, uh, life, but it is not QED as we know it in the continuum limit. All right. So let us just take a short look on what this model is actually doing. Uh, we simulated this together with Debussy and Fu Jun Zhang and um, a former PhD student, uh, Philip Wittmer. And um, this is the Hamiltonian I showed you before. There are these plaquette terms. The link term is actually a trivial constant. And then uh, motivated by some condensed matter work, we introduced what is known as a Rockshark Kivelson term. And so here you see the phase diagram of this system. Uh, it has this rockshar kibbelson coupling lambda, which sort of is interesting to introduce because otherwise we would be limited to zero here. We could then explore the temperature axis and we would find that the system exists in a confined phase and 
then at finite temperature it deconfines, which is not so unusual. The U1 Wilson type lattice field theory would do the same. But this system is a bit funny. If you change this parameter lambda, you can realize another confined phase. And in this confined phase, actually charge conjugation is spontaneously broken. This is essentially excluded in relativistic theories by the buffer witten theorem, but here it happens. Um, and then there is an interesting point here at zero temperature. There's a quantum phase transition. Um, for a short while, we thought it is a quantum critical point, but it is not. It's just a very weak first order phase transition. And um, in a sense, the theory tries to deconfine. It produces a long correlation length, but uh, I mean, um, uh, we should not be surprised that a U1 gauge theory in two plus one dimensions cannot deconfine because there is a Polyakov insight, uh, which was um, made rigorous by Gupfert and Mack in the context of Wilson's uh, U1 lattice gauge theory. Uh, but still, this model is interesting. It has interesting dynamics. It produces confining strings, which uh, have different strands. And the interior of this uh, string strand, which exists in one of these two confined phases, actually has the other confined phase in it, the one that has this checkerboard pattern here. If we cross this quantum phase transition, then the bulk is filled with this uh, checkerboard phase in which translation by one lattice spacing is spontaneously broken. And then the strands uh, of that uh, string uh, are actually filled with the bulk phase, this red phase here. So there's a lot of interesting stuff going on that we are not used to from Wilson type lattice gauge theories. And here we see uh, almost a Coulomb uh, field uh, of this almost but not quite deconfined uh, system of a charge and anti-charge that we stuck into, into the system. And then if you heat the system up, the strings disappear and the system deconfines. So it has interesting non-perturbative dynamics, but this is not what we uh, encounter in nature as QED, okay? Um, so any questions about these abelian models? And then I will move on to the non-abelian models. Okay, if there are no questions, I will go to the non-abelian models. And the goal is to use discrete quantum degrees of freedom to um, regularize quantum chromodynamics in four space-time dimensions and therefore gluon fields should now emerge in the same way as uh, CPN fields emerge from quantum spins. So first of all, how do we construct a non-abelian quantum link operator? Uh, in a non-abelian Wilson type lattice gauge theory, the parallel transporter would connect neighboring lattice sites and it would take values in the gauge group. Now in quantum link models, uh, these objects are not numbers, they are operators like quantum spins and uh, a quantum link operator, uh, non-abelian, is still forms an n by n matrix, like in the Wilson theory. So it has two color indices, i and j, which range from one to capital N, if you want to build it SUN or UN uh, lattice gauge theory. Now, this thing used to be a complex number in the Wilson theory, which is subject to certain constraints. Um, here, the real and imaginary part of this complex number are replaced by two Hermitian operators. And then the U dagger is constructed with the Hermitian conjugate. And since these are quantum spin-like operators, again, the U and the U dagger, they will not commute with each other. So these are not numbers. These are really uh, living in some algebra. 
And then in a non-abelian gauge theory, we have to ensure SUN left and right gauge invariance on the two ends of the link. And these uh, gauge transformations must obey the uh, algebra of SUN. Now it is natural in this case to start thinking about UN rather than just SUN. And therefore I've again thrown in here also an abelian generator. This is the same E that we've seen before and it doesn't care about left or right because it is abelian. And so these things then uh, obey certain commutation relations. Now the link variables should transform appropriately under these gauge transformations. And we've seen this relation before in the abelian theory. In the non-abelian theory, the link, which is a matrix, an n by n matrix, whose elements are no longer numbers, but operators, uh, they obey certain commutation relations. And these commutation relations are exactly the same as in the, they would be in the non-abelian Wilson theory except that they are now imposed on totally different objects, namely not on group valued functions and their conjugate momenta, but on quantum spin-like degrees of freedom. And so this uh, gives us a non-abelian structure. The non-abelian gauge group could be UN or SUN, SON, SPN, and even an exceptional group if you want. And so let's uh, see how this works if the gauge symmetry should be UN, which contains SUN, which is what we really want. Um, then we have the elements of the non-abelian um, quantum link, and there's N squared of these elements, but each of them has a real and an imaginary part that is represented by a Hermitian operator. So there are two N squared Hermitian operators that make the link variable, the quantum link. Then we have generators on the left and on the right. They generate SUN algebras, and therefore there's two times N squared minus one of them. And then uh, since we want to do UN, we have an additional U1 generator. So one more generator, which gives us four N squared minus one generators, which obey certain commutation relations. And then you can inspect these commutation relations and convince yourself that they actually generate an algebra SU2N. Um, now this SU2N algebra is just an embedding structure, finite structure that holds the whole thing together. Nowhere does the theory have an SU2N symmetry. The gauge symmetry will be UN or SUN. But the elements of the theory are the 4N squared minus 1 generators of that algebra. So we call this an embedding algebra. If we want to do U1, then the embedding algebra is SU2, and we can just do what we did in the abelian theory, where we were working with SU2 quantum spins. If we want to do UN, we use an algebra of SU2N. Now in the abelian model, I was free to choose any representation of the embedding algebra SU2. I could make a lattice gauge theory of spins one half, I could make a lattice gauge theory of spins uh, three halves or 5,000, whatever I want. And so I can make lattice gauge theories um, with any representation of the embedding algebra SU2N. And there's a lot of them, and I can generate a lot of different uh, non-abelian gauge theories which have exact SUN gauge symmetry by construction, but uh, most of them will have nothing to do with QCD. Some of them, give us QCD as I will argue in the last five minutes of my talk. Now you can also, if you want, uh, construct SON or SPN gauge theories. The embedding algebras are then SO2N and SP2N. Okay, so how do these discrete systems with finite dimensional Hilbert spaces ever become uh, QCD. So we need to make a gluon field. 
And if you remember how I made a CPN field, then you may not be surprised that I'll now suggest to introduce a higher dimension. So we are now going to five dimensions. And um, that fifth dimension uh, um, we can think of as an additional spatial dimension. Um, and why are we doing this? Um, we do this because we want to stick to a discrete variable. And um, the Wilson theory doesn't do that. It uses continuously varying uh, gauge fields. Now we'll pile up these discrete degrees of freedom in an extra dimension, and we'll then produce QCD by dimensional reduction. Now, in the spin model case, in the CPN case, the higher dimensional theory in two plus one dimensions was not asymptotically free. It was actually free in a sense. It was a theory of weakly interacting Goldstone bosons. And in five dimensions, non-abelian gauge theories are also no, no longer asymptotically free. They are free in the sense that they can exist in massless non-abelian Coulomb phases. And this is what we take advantage of. If we can construct a quantum link model that happens to land in four plus one dimensions in such a Coulomb phase, then that means that there is an effective low energy description. The system has an infinite correlation length and that infinite correlation length corresponds to a massless deconfined gluon. And then just like you can construct uh, uh, effective field theories for quantum spin models, the effective field theory for a quantum link model would be a non-abelian gauge theory in five dimensions. And um, it is not guaranteed at all that all these quantum link models would give us massless Coulomb phases, um, but I can, uh, argue and perhaps even prove that this can happen for specifically chosen representations. Um, this I can prove with semi-classical methods if I allow myself to make the representation very big, which is not what I really want to do, uh, but there are ways to getting into these Coulomb phases. Um, and if you are in such a Coulomb phase, then you are in business because then you have a 5D theory with um, infinite correlation lengths. Infinite correlation lengths for a lattice uh, person means we have a continuum limit. Um, of course, I would like to get QCD with live, which lives in four dimensions or not in five dimensions. And therefore, I will again make one of the, those five dimensions of finite extent. And when I do that, um, I no longer am in five dimensions because suddenly one of the dimensions is short. Then if the gluon would remain massless, this would mean that we found a non-abelian gauge theory in four dimensions that does not have confinement. Now, nobody seems to think that this is possible. Actually. We have never seen such a thing. There is no rigorous proof of confinement, like there is a rigorous proof of the Merman-Wagner theorem, which is sort of the a spin analog of this statement. We know that Goldstone bosons don't remain massless if you take them from two plus one to two dimensions. And so gluons will not remain massless if you compactify them out of such a five-dimensional Coulomb phase they have to pick up a mass because four-dimensional non-abelian gauge theories are confining. And if that is so, then I can follow the same logic and integrate out my fifth dimension, my poor man's dimensional reduction. Actually, Peter Hasenfratz uh, uh, has unpublished notes, which I don't have, where he do, did this in his wonderful way by systematically integrating out all the non-zero modes um, and proving that this uh, dimensional reduction, it works exactly like this. 
Um, and that is what uh, we use in quantum link models. The coupling constant of the dimensionally reduced theta g squared is given by the extent of the extra dimension combined with the dimension full uh, coupling constant 1 over, e, 1 over e squared of the 5D theory. And um, since the 4D theory, non-abelian gauge theory, is asymptotically free, we know that the correlation lengths and therefore inverse mass gap is exponentially large in this 1 over g squared, which is the extent of the extra dimension. And then the logic is exactly like in the spin model. If that dimension, the extent of the fifth dimension becomes finite, uh, then the correlation length becomes exponentially large in this beta here. And if I make that beta a little bit bigger, the correlation length will become so much bigger in the physical space-time dimension so that the system indeed undergoes dimensional reduction. And then I have every reason to think that this can only be QCD because of universality as there is nothing else available in that uh, universality class. And uh, if that is not true, then there would be some other universality class which would also be very exciting but extremely unlikely. Okay, so far uh, for the gluon field, it emerges as a collective degree of freedom of quantum links, just like um, Goldstone boson fields emerge uh, from the collective dynamics of quantum spins. And then you go through dimensional reduction. Since you have a massless theory without any fine tuning, completely naturally in the high dimensional theory, you will get the asymptotically free highly non-trivial, non-perturbative interacting theory after dimensional reduction. Okay. So, um, yeah. If you wanted to quantum simulate this uh, um, theory, would you have to go use the five-dimensional theory to describe the four-dimensional dimensional reduced uh, Lagrangian or, or uh, can you? Go? Yes, you would have to pile up these discrete degrees of freedom. Uh, for example, in the quantum spin ladder system that I discussed at the beginning, uh, already with four transversely coupled spin chains, I got a fairly large correlation length. With six spin chains, I got a correlation length that is big enough to do uh, the take the continuum limit. And so also here, if you really want to do this with quantum simulation experiments, in the somewhat distant future, but maybe not infinitely distant future, then yes, you would have to build something like that extra dimension, but that doesn't mean that you have to beam yourself to another part of the multiverse. You have to simply uh, use some internal degrees of freedom to uh, realize these extra states. And this is actually what um, the cold atoms people are already doing with these alkaline earth atoms. They have used internal states to mimic an extra dimension. Um, but I can't say that I have a concrete proposal with existing atoms how to do this for full QCD. What we actually proposed with Peter Zoller was more of a toy model type. And... Uh, I mean, I'm already over time, but uh, so to complete the actual uh, content of my talk that I was intended to cover, I just need to show you this one transparency here, which just says that, uh, oops, we ended, we landed in five dimensions. And uh, we had to go to this fifth dimension because we wanted to make a gluon field as an emergent field out of quantum link, the discrete quantum degrees of freedom. So we got into the fifth dimension for reasons that um, are new in a sense, right? You, we, you wouldn't need this in the Wilson theory. But David Kaplan had introduced this fifth dimension uh, in order to naturally produce uh, uh, chiral fermions, chiral fermions, that is fermions with a global chiral symmetry as we encounter them in QCD. And this uh, domain wall fermion formulation fits completely naturally with quantum link models. 
and then you can simultaneously take the continuum limit by making the size of the extra dimension uh, a little bit bigger and then a little, little bit more big, but not really very big. Uh, and also the domain wall fermions with their exponentially decaying wave functions uh, would become more and more massless and approach the Carroll limit as the extent of the extra dimension increases. So this is our construction that we proposed a long time ago with Shailish Chandrasekharan and also in collaboration with Richard Brower as an unconventional regularization of QCD. At that time, we were hoping to be able to design numerical methods. Um, my hopes are not dead, but I uh, have not uh, uh, found sufficiently uh, good ideas and not too many people have worked on this as far as I know. But then the idea of quantum simulation came across. I just uh, show you very briefly these last transparencies. And um, uh, we then together with uh, Peter Zoller and also with Debasi, who played a um, leading role in this project, my former students, uh, Michael Bögli and Pascal Stäbler were involved, and then also Marcello Dal Monte, who several of you might know, and Enrique Rico. Uh, we came up with this proposal to use these wonderful alkaline earth atoms to uh, stick them into an optical super lattice and uh, actually mimic some of these uh, gauge dynamics. It's not yet fully fledged QCD. It is in a lower space-time dimension. It doesn't have the chiral symmetry of domain wall fermions, but it is something that could be built in the laboratory to explore the dynamics of such uh, discrete theories. And this is how I will end. Um, I wrote a review article on this kind of stuff a long time ago. Actually, I'm in sabbatical. Can you imagine this? In Corona time, I'm sitting here at home and this is one of the rare occasions where I can interact with the rest of the world. So thank you very much to listen for listening to my talk. And recently with many co-authors, we wrote another review article which has just appeared or has just uh, been accepted for publication too. And the, the first author is Marie Carmen Banuls, who you also know, some of you know quite well. Okay, and there's my conclusions. I will not walk through all of this. I will just say the path towards quantum simulation of QCD will be a long one. Um, however, with a lot of interesting physics along the way and quantum link models, I'm convinced are a very promising tool for going in this interesting direction. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, yeah, please, everyone can feel f free to unmute, and uh, let's thank uh, Uwe for this nice talk. So yeah, please, uh, if there are uh, further questions, then yeah, please just unmute yourself. So, so one of the points in your conclusions is about uh, quantum simulation of um, evolution of string breaking or false vacuum decay uh, and expansion of hot coagulant plasma. Can, can you expand a bit on these points, please? Yes, I have not prepared transparencies for this. I have them in some other talk, but... Um, in our first paper with uh, Peter Zoller, where also Debasic was involved, we concentrated on abelian models. And um, uh, so we used the quantum link model to construct a kind of toy model U1 lattice gauge theory. Not, the goal was not to take the continuum limit of any uh, field theory like uh, QED or even just the Schwinger model, we just had a U1 lattice gauge theory with confining strings. And um, um, 
the theory had a variant where we could introduce a theta vacuum uh, parameter and then you can have two vacuum states and you can ask how a false vacuum might become a true vacuum through a tunneling effect. So, so of course, in these quantum simulator constructions, one wants to focus on those things that are unthinkable at the moment to do with the standard formulation, right? And nobody knows how to simulate in real time, at least uh, for, so for very long times or, and beyond uh, one plus one uh, dimensions, right? Because of a very severe sign problem that affects any classical simulation. And so this is what we focused on. We said, if you can build such a thing, you can see how uh, strings break by uh, materializing fermion-antifermion pairs from the vacuum. And uh, such quantum simulation experiments have been done after this. Uh, there was a experiment in the group of Rainer Blatt in Innsbruck uh, where they used a kind of quantum computer uh, with uh, calcium ions and they argued that they also did essentially this kind of stuff. I mean, it was a very small lattice and you can argue a lot, but uh, um, we focused more on the quantum simulation rather than quantum computation because we wanted the thing to be as scalable as possible and that is uh, much easier with uh, cold atoms in an optical lattice, which is what we proposed. And then in the second paper, we uh, generalized this to non-abelian theories. And we have um, several papers, also one where we mimic certain effects in nuclear physics. And uh, all this is in quotation marks. It's not the nuclear physics that we encounter in the real universe. It is some physics that enjoys a baryon number which is conserved and uh, also has some uh, primitive form of chiral symmetry it has non-abelian gauge fields in it so3 not su3 so there were a lot of toy model aspects in it but then if you build such a kind of system in a cold atoms laboratory you can mimic something like an evolution of a quark gluon plasma all in many quotation marks because it is toy model gluons that uh, do these kind of things. And the focus was always on real-time dynamics because this is what a quantum simulator can do and we don't know how to do this with classical simulation. Thank you. Okay, if there are no further questions, then let's thank uh, Uwe again. Yes, thank you all for listening.